This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. It's common practice to reserve a plot next to your loved one's grave in anticipation of your own death. But Jonathan Reed took it one step further. The retired merchant was devastated when his beloved wife, Mary E. Gould Reed, died in 1893. After Mary's internment in her father's family vault on March 19th of that year, Jonathan visited regularly, a little too often in the opinion of his father-in-law. When Mary's father died in 1895, Reed was free to visit her tomb to his heart's content. So he had her casket transferred to another vault in the Whispering Grove section of the cemetery. There he put an empty casket next to hers, a placeholder for his inevitable end. And it is here that Jonathan Reed's tale takes a surprising twist. Unable to bear being away from his wife's corpse, Jonathan moved in to Mary's mausoleum. He brought furniture and a wood stove and cheered up the place with mementos from Mary's life, her paintings, her unfinished knitting, and the family's pet parrot, which, upon the death of the bird, was stuffed. Jonathan even took his meals inside the crypt. As news of the devoted widower spread, visitors came by to catch a glimpse of the man who now made his home living amongst the dead. Nearly 7,000 people reportedly wandered through Evergreen's cemetery for the sole purpose of encountering Jonathan Reed. The New York Times even covered the story, explaining helpfully, Mr. Reed could never be made to believe that his wife was really dead, his explanation of her condition being that the warmth had simply left her body and that if he kept the mausoleum warm, she would continue to sleep peacefully in the costly metallic casket in which her remains were put. According to witnesses, he carried on long conversations with his wife. The Times reported that he really believed that his wife could understand what he was saying to her. For nearly ten years, Jonathan made his happy home in Mary's tomb. Then in May 1905, caretakers discovered his still body on the crypt's floor, his arms outstretched to the casket of his dearly departed wife. Jonathan Reed was interred next to Mary in his prepared casket. The doors to the vault were sealed, and the doors remain locked to this day. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome to Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour, if there is one thing on Earth that we can all agree is most likely to be haunted, it's a graveyard. Since the advent of civilization, we have gathered our dead and placed them in burial plots together. And it's no surprise that people talk of the spirits that linger not far from the final resting place of the bodies, perhaps clinging to life or serving as a grim omen for what's to come when we all meet our end. Some of these cemeteries, however, boast more ghost stories than others. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to follow Weird Darkness on Facebook and Twitter, and visit WeirdDarkness.com to find the daily Weird Darkness podcast. Watch streaming B-horror movies and horror hosts 24-7 for free. Listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated. Send me your own true story of something paranormal that's happened to you or someone you know, and more. You can find it all at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, 
turn off your lights and come with me into the weird darkness. Just outside of Chicago, Archer Avenue leads motorists past Resurrection Cemetery, the final resting spot of a young woman killed in the 1930s. Many believe the same young woman mysteriously returns to the cemetery night after night, dancing and hitchhiking her way back down the avenue. Of all of Chicago's ghost stories, this one has been told and retold for over 80 years. Resurrection Mary, as she is called, was reportedly first sighted in 1939 when a man named Jerry Paulus met a beautiful young blonde woman in a white dress at a local dance hall. After dancing together all night, Jerry offered the beautiful stranger a ride home. She directed him down Archer Avenue, stopping in front of Resurrection Cemetery, where she vanished before reaching the front gates. Decades later, tales of encounters with Resurrection Mary continued to surface. One of the most prominent sightings of the spirit was reported in the Suburban Trib in 1979. Reporter Bill Geist interviewed a man named Ralph for an article aptly titled, Cryptic Rider Leaves Taxi Driver with the Willies. The taxi driver requested that his last name be withheld, although he stuck by his chilling story. He didn't want people to think he was crazy. Ralph explained that he had picked up a strange young woman in a white dress one evening who had directed him down Archer Avenue. She was mostly silent, except to remark that the snows had come early this year. When she abruptly requested that he stop in front of Resurrection Cemetery, Ralph slammed on the brakes. He looked away only for a moment when something happened that made his blood run cold. When I turned, she was gone, vanished, and the door never opened. May the good Lord strike me dead, it never opened. Throughout the years, dozens of other men have come forward with eerily similar stories. They all involved an attractive blonde wearing a white party dress who would dance and ultimately disappear near the cemetery. Some claimed to see her walking down the road, sometimes even jumping into oncoming traffic. Others would say that they stopped to give the girl a ride and, in traditional vanishing hitchhiker form, the white-clad woman would disappear as they neared Resurrection Cemetery, sometimes after she got out of the car and sometimes as the driver walked around to the passenger side to open her door. The stories of the girl behind the ghost vary. The most prominent is that Mary, as she has come to be called, was out one evening with a boyfriend, dancing at the O. Henry Ballroom, which is now the Willow Brook Ballroom. They got into a spat and, unable to stand his company any longer, the young woman stormed out of the ballroom to walk home alone. Not long after departing the dance hall, Mary was struck by a car. The driver fled the scene, leaving her for dead. Mary's parents later found her body. They dressed her in a white gown and dancing shoes and buried her in Resurrection Cemetery. The young woman's spirit then rose from the grave wandering the cemetery grounds and haunting her favorite dancing places. Unlike other reported ghosts, it seems that this spirit does not hide from human contact. Rather, she seeks it out. The story of Resurrection Mary's death explains another type of strange encounter that people have had with her spirit. Several people traveling down Archer Avenue have made distressed phone calls to police claiming to have discovered a young woman's body on the side of the road, seemingly abandoned after a hit-and-run accident. When officers report to the scene, the body seems to have vanished. The only sign left behind was a dent in the grass, in the shape of a human body. Over the years, many researchers have attempted to pin the ghost's identity on young women named Mary that were killed in automotive accidents in the late 1920s or early 1930s. One theory poses that the disturbed spirit is Mary Bregovy, a 21-year-old woman who was killed in 1934 when the driver of the vehicle she was riding in crashed into a structure on the side of the road. 
Another possibility is that Resurrection Mary is the ghost of Anna Norcus, whose devotion to the Virgin Mary led her to adopt the name Marisia, which is Lithuanian for Mary, as her middle name. Norcus was killed in an automobile accident in 1927 on her way home from an evening spent at the O. Henry Ballroom. However, Mary Bregovi was a brunette, and Anna Norcus was just shy of 13 years old, so neither matched the description of a blonde in her early 20s. They also weren't involved in hit-and-run accidents, leaving the true identity of Resurrection Mary a mystery. Another chilling aspect of this local legend involves the cemetery itself. Resurrection Cemetery encompasses over 540 acres, making it one of the largest and possibly most haunted cemeteries in North America. One night a man reported seeing a young woman who looked like she was locked in the vast cemetery. When a police officer went to go check out the scene, he didn't see anyone there. However, the bars on the gate of the cemetery looked scorched and warped. Although authorities chalk it up to a maintenance accident with a truck, legend has it that Resurrection Mary seared the bars with her hands when she grasped them, as if trying to free herself. In any case, Mary's story has captivated ghost hunters for decades. Some write it off as merely an urban legend, but the consistent sightings of this mysterious figure over the years are undeniably striking. Up next, I'll have the story of Chicago's Bachelor's Grove, one of the most haunted cemeteries in the world. Do you have a true paranormal story that's happened to you or someone you know? Share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness returns in just a moment. It is the dark and lonely road. You drive, you're tired and falling asleep behind the wheel. The windows are down, the cool air blowing through your hair as you crank up the stereo. ACDC blares on the radio and you're screaming out the chorus. Then a set of headlights emerges from the darkness and your night has become a nightmare. Welcome to Last Exit an anthology of 17 horrific tales where life on the road can sometimes take a dark and unexpected turn. Last Exit by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. Have you checked out the Monster Channel? It has horror hosts, B-horror movies, retro television commercials, and a whole lot more. You can watch it anytime, absolutely free, 24-7, 365, on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where we have our Weirdo Watch Party once a month, where we all gather together, watch a really bad B-horror movie, make jokes about it in the chat room, and just have a lot of fun. It's always free. You can find out more about it, find out when our next Weirdo Watch Party is going to be, and, and more by going to the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. Now back to more haunted cemeteries, graveyards, and mausoleums on Weird Darkness. Elsewhere in Chicagoland, in the Chicago suburbs, screened from the city by the nearby Rubio Woods Forest Preserve, lies an abandoned graveyard widely believed to be the most haunted place in the region. Over the years, more than a hundred different hauntings and otherworldly encounters have been reported in Bachelor's Grove Cemetery, from floating orbs of light above gravestones to a phantom farmhouse and even a two-headed apparition. Once part of a larger settlement, the land that became Bachelor's Grove Cemetery was set aside for use as a burying place in the 1800s, when the body of its first permanent resident was interred there. 
The cemetery was originally called Everdon, in honor of Samuel Everdon who donated the property. According to those who lived and worked near the cemetery, it was once much like a park, with a nearby lagoon used for fishing and swimming. Reports of the paranormal began surfacing in the 1950s, though Bachelors Grove had already earned a sinister reputation. Gangsters from the 1920s and 1930s allegedly used the area to dump bodies and hide illegal firearms. By the 1960s, the number of funerals at Bachelors Grove had dwindled to near zero. By the time the final burial took place in 1989, vandals began raiding the site each night, knocking over and stealing headstones. According to some, coffins were even dug up and corpses desecrated. As Bachelors Grove slipped into abandonment, reports of nefarious activity intensified. Forest rangers patrolling the area reportedly found the remains of animals that had been ritualistically mutilated, along with other evidence of occult activities. Several people reported seeing satanic rituals being carried out in the cemetery, complete with animal sacrifice. The number of ghostly encounters grew as well. Some of the earliest reported phenomena involved orbs of blue light appearing above graves and seemingly moving with intelligence. Another strange tale tells of a phantom farmhouse. Though seldom seen in the same place twice, the building is said to almost always appear as a white homestead with wooden columns and a porch swing on the front porch and a lantern burning in the window. If one tries to approach the phantom structure, however, it begins to shrink, receding with each step until it disappears altogether. The cemetery's nearby lagoon plays host to a well-known haunting as well. Many have seen a ghostly farmer and his horse still pulling a plow along its banks. The sighting stems from the legend of a local farmer who drowned in the lagoon alongside his horse in the 1870s. So the story goes, the horse rushed into the lagoon without reason dragging the farmer to his death. Encounters of a two-headed creature emerging from the lagoon at night have led some to believe that the vision is actually the half-formed apparition of the farmer and his horse. Other common ghostly sightings in Bachelors Grove Cemetery include a white lady who carries her infant through the grounds under the glow of the full moon, figures dressed in robes, a mysterious black dog, and a light like a red skyrocket that speeds up and down the trail leading to the entrance of the cemetery. Nor are the hauntings restricted just to the burying ground. The nearby roads have also been the site of numerous reports of vanishing or phantom vehicles. Unsurprisingly, Bachelors Grove is a favorite midnight destination for legend trippers and ghost hunters alike. Several people have returned with what they consider photographic evidence of the supernatural. Perhaps the most striking is a picture taken in 1991 by members of the Ghost Research Society that shows a woman sitting on a gravestone in the cemetery. Dubbed the Madonna of Bachelors Grove, the photograph has been published in both the Chicago Sun-Times and the National Examiner and is one of the most famous or infamous paranormal photos of all time. We'll continue with more stories of haunted graveyards and cemeteries when Weird Darkness returns. Although I have more stories than I could possibly fit into this hour of the broadcast, so what I don't use here I'll be placing in the Sudden Death Overtime content in the podcast, which I will be uploading immediately after tonight's show is over. You can stay up to date on everything Weird Darkness by signing up for the email newsletter. Sign up for the Weird Darkness newsletter for free at WeirdDarkness.com. In 2019, six teenagers tried to rob a Chicago home, and it ended with one dead, shot by the homeowner. A Minnesota man is confronted by burglars at his home in 2012 and ends up being charged with murder for killing the intruders. In 2023, a man was killed after he broke into a home and the homeowner is charged with murder. 
As a listener to Weird Darkness, you know how bad things can go in a crime, and even when defending yourself against the criminals, sometimes you are the one facing legal problems. That's why you never let the criminals get access to your home to begin with. Home security is no longer recommended. It is essential. And with ADT, it's no longer for the elite. It's for everyone. Right now, you can get a free home security system from ADT to keep burglars from entering your home in the first place. Just visit WeirdDarkness.com slash ADT. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash ADT. ADT is the biggest and most trusted name in home security and has been since 1874. And they are still equipping people like you and me with the newest and best home security technology with 24-7 monitoring and 24-7 customer service. Whether your home is basic or ultra-smart, ADT is the best option for your home security. And again, you can get a free custom-built home security system with the latest technology by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash ADT. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash ADT. Nestled in a quiet neighborhood near Hickory Hill Park is Iowa City's Oakland Cemetery. The burial ground is home to numerous monuments to the dead, including one striking statue with a dark reputation – the Bronze Black Angel. The figure dates back to the early 20th century and stands watch over the graves of Teresa Dolezal and her family. Teresa moved to Iowa City with her son Eddie in the late 1800s. There she worked as a midwife until 1891 when Eddie contracted meningitis and died. The boy's body was buried in Oakland Cemetery and a monument carved in the shape of a tree stump was erected to mark his grave. After Eddie's death, Teresa moved to Oregon where she met and married Nicholas Feldevert. But Feldevert was not long in this world either. He died only a few years later, in 1911. Stricken by two losses so close together, Teresa returned to Iowa City and commissioned the construction of an eight-and-a-half-foot-tall bronze angel from Chicago artist Mario Corbell to memorialize her loved ones. As soon as the statue arrived by train car, stories began to circulate. When the statue was erected in 1913, Eddie's monument was moved to stand beside it while the ashes of Nicholas Feldevert were placed within the statue's base. When Teresa Feldevert herself passed away in 1924, her ashes joined those of her late husband. Curiously, no death date was added to Teresa's name at the base, fueling the statue's mystery. What's more, the Black Angel statue has turned from bronze to black by the time of Teresa's death, Local legends sprang up to explain this phenomenon, with most centering on Teresa's passing. Some claimed that she was an evil, mysterious woman and that the statue changed its colors to warn others to stay away from her grave. One particularly dramatic telling told of a thunderstorm on the night of Teresa's funeral. A lightning bolt struck the angel statue, scorching it black. Other versions blamed the blackening of the statue on infidelity, claiming that Teresa swore on her husband's grave to remain faithful until her death and that the monument would turn black if she didn't keep her vow. Some even claimed that Eddie Dolezal never died of meningitis but was murdered by Teresa herself, the angel statue blackened as a mark of her guilt. Little proof exists to corroborate any such claims and many explain the color change as the natural process of oxidation. Still, the legends persist, with some asserting that the angel's eyes had turned black as coal overnight, and the blackness then spread down its face as though the angel was weeping. With such a reputation, it's no wonder the black angel statue is now said to possess sinister powers. According to one tale, any girl kissed in the shadow of the angel's wings will die within six months, and anyone who touches the angel on Halloween night will die in seven years. Kissing the angel directly, meanwhile, will cause a person's heart to stop instantly. One variation states that only a virgin can survive touching or kissing the statue 
without being struck dead. Another claims that the angel itself gets down from its pedestal and walks the cemetery at night. In 2013, the Sci-Fi Channel series Haunted Highway visited Oakland Cemetery to do an episode on The Black Angel, which aired on December 18th. Investigators captured odd sounds and visual anomalies throughout the cemetery. When they turned their thermal cameras onto the Black Angel statue, they found that it showed up as glowing hot, even though the night around it was chilly. Whatever the truth of the many legends, there's no doubting the Black Angel's power as a monument. Pretty much anyone who grew up in Kansas, including yours truly, or if you watch the show Supernatural, you know about Stull Cemetery, even if you've never seen it personally. According to legend, this cemetery contains a stairway, not to heaven, but straight to hell. It's one of seven reputed places on Earth where living people can descend to the realm of the damned. The staircase is said to appear only once a year, suddenly a hidden staircase is revealed, descending into a grave, then into the underworld. Most versions of the story say it happens on the stroke of midnight on Halloween. Others say the stairway to hell opens on the spring equinox. So if you ever find these stairs, you must never go down them, because you will never come back. From there, the tales vary, with accounts claiming that Satan himself comes forth on Halloween night to hold court in the cursed cemetery. In some versions, Satan comes to visit the grave of his infant son, while others maintain that it is the grave of a witch that the Prince of Darkness visits, who was the mother of his son, who also appears on the scene as a werewolf. Many of the legends surrounding Stull Cemetery center on an old stone church that stood there from 1867 until 2002. The Evangelical Emmanuel Church was built by the town's original Pennsylvania Dutch settlers, who held their services in German until 1908. Then the church sat empty for much of the 20th century, its roof falling in, walls beginning to crumble, even as strange stories clustered tight around it. The church is said to have been used by Satanists, witches, and cults for their rituals. Though it had no roof by the time these groups supposedly convened there, it was said that rain would never fall within its walls. Other accounts claimed that it was impossible to break a glass bottle inside the church. Next to the church was a tall pine tree which grew up through and split a headstone. According to stories, the tree was used to hang witches before the land was consecrated as a churchyard. The church and the tree were often held to be signposts, helping to point the way to the gate of hell. In 1998, on the day before Halloween, the tree was cut down in order to dissuade thrill-seekers. Stull's status as the location of one of the gateways of hell is so well-known that it inspired an album by the band Urge Overkill, featuring images of Stull Cemetery on the album cover. It was also used in the plots of several movies, including the mechanizations of the satanic villains in Turbulence 3 who planned to crash a plane into Stull Cemetery in order to release Satan. The film also makes use of an urban legend that when the Pope visited Colorado in 1995, he diverted his plane around Kansas so as not to fly over on hollowed ground. In the final episode of the fifth season of the TV series Supernatural, the final confrontation of the apocalypse takes place in Stull Cemetery, though it is actually filmed in Vancouver. Depictions like these have done nothing to dissuade amateur ghost hunters, thrill-seekers, and legend-trippers from descending upon Stull Cemetery, especially on Halloween night. In spite of fences, no trespassing signs, and the fact that the area is heavily patrolled by police, the residents of the small community of Stull have had to deal with countless instances of trespassing and vandalism. In 1978, more than 150 people attempted to go to the cemetery on Halloween night. 
1988, that number climbed to nearly 500. The cemetery today is home to as many broken headstones as ones that are still intact, and many of the markers are gone completely, spirited off by vandals who wanted a piece of the famously accursed burying place. Stories about Stull often claim that it is guarded by mysterious people in pickup trucks who terrorize visitors. Those stories, at least, are almost certainly true, though perhaps less mysterious than they might appear. The living residents of Stull aren't exactly thrilled by the cemetery's diabolical reputation and the often less-than-respectful tourists, so residents frequently aid the police in patrolling the area. In pickup trucks. Tracing the origins of the stories about Stull is no easy matter, though. The area has had its share of odd deaths over the years, including a boy who was accidentally burned to death and a man who was found hanging in a tree. Yet according to the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, Stull Cemetery's reputation as one of the seven gateways to hell can be traced back to a professor at the nearby University of Kansas who made it up as an urban legend to tell his students. As the story spread, it took on a life of its own until it was printed in the university paper in the 1970s. Whatever the origins of the diabolical legends, most people who still live in the community today and have ancestors buried in the old churchyard just want to see them rest in peace. Barbados may be known as a popular tourist destination, but local culture and history involve more than just white sand beaches and fruity mixed drinks. In the center of the island is Christ Parish Church, whose graveyard, like many graveyards, has a few ghost stories. One particular tale involves a family's tragic saga and a legacy of post-mortem unrest. In 1808, the Chase family purchased the vault for the burial of their child, an infant by the name of Mary Ann Maria. Some claim her name was Anne Marie or Mary Ann Maria. The tomb had been built in 1724 and already held the body of Miss Thomasina Goddard, buried in 1807. Colonel Thomas Chase, patriarch of the family, decided against disturbing the deceased by moving her coffin out of his new family vault. For years after they buried their baby, the Chases had to bury another child, their daughter Dorcas. The circumstances surrounding her death were more than slightly unusual. The young girl starved herself to death, apparently as an act of rebellion against her father Thomas, who was supposedly abusing her. The girl's body was buried beside her infant sisters, each small body held in lead caskets. Just one month after burying Dorcas, Thomas Chase himself died. Strangely, his death was also a suicide. The family prepared Thomas's body and opened the Chase vault, but what they claimed to find inside was shocking. Where there had previously been three coffins lined neatly in a row, the tomb was now a scattered mess, with each casket upended and in a different place. The coffins themselves seemed to have been moved. The Chase family was shocked, but they chalked up the scene to grave robbers. The coffins were once again arranged neatly, and Thomas's casket, made of lead just as his daughter's had been and weighing nearly 240 pounds, was added. The massive marble stone was rolled back into place, taking several men to do so, and the entrance was sealed. The next death in the family was Charles Brewster Ames in 1816. Again, the 11-year-old's body was prepared for burial and the chase vault was opened. The invasion of 1812 seemed to have happened again. All four coffins, including Thomas's tremendously heavy one, were displaced as if they'd been tossed like toys, and yet the entrance had not been tampered with. Once again, the coffins were returned to their original place and the tomb was resealed. It was around this time that the public began to take interest in the stories that were being told of the moving coffins. Twice more, in 1816 and in 1819, the tomb was reopened to add the coffin of a family member, and both times 
the vault was said to have been rearranged from within. It seemed that the dead really were not at rest. Secondary stories of hearing shrieks from within the tomb or of horses being spooked while passing it also became more and more prevalent. The governor of Barbados himself even took interest in the case. He ordered an inspection of the Chase Vault, inside and out, and after being satisfied that it was secure, had a fine dust sprinkled on the floor and his own signet ring stamped into the seal on the door. Eight months later, he returned. Externally, everything was in order and the seal was intact. Curiosity called for the door to be opened, at which point onlookers saw to their horror that the coffins, once again, had been thrown about inside the chamber. This time, the movement seemed to be quite violent, with Mary Ann's coffin thrown so forcefully into a wall that the corner of her casket had broken off. This was the last time the vault was reopened. Each coffin was individually buried, hoping to restore some peace to the individuals whose bodies were inside. The tomb itself remains empty today and open with nothing but stories passing through. Although the story has circulated for over 200 years, researchers call it historically dubious. No burial records or newspaper articles exist to confirm the tale as it allegedly happened, and certain details of the event echo a Freemason allegory of secret vaults and restless coffins. However, there was a Chase family living in Barbados at the time, and others who swear by the facts of the tale. Whether or not it can be known for certain, it seems telling that the tomb has remained open, that the Chase family bodies have remained separated, specifically those of Dorcas and her father Thomas, and no mysterious movement has since happened. Where Darkness continues with more true stories of haunted cemeteries, graveyards, and mausoleums, up next. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and murderous minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Cemeteries everywhere are considered haunted for many reasons, including grave robbery, unmarked or forgotten burials, natural disasters that disturb resting places, or sometimes even because the deceased was not properly buried at all. Add all of that to the fact that graveyards are often dark, somber places and you've got the perfect setting for a ghost, or two, or several. 
Before we close out this episode, let's explore some of the world's most haunted cemeteries that we have yet to touch on. But don't forget to hold your breath as you drive by these places, or you might breathe in the spirit of someone who has recently died. Pinewood Historic Cemetery, Coral Gables, Florida According to legend, an elderly woman's grave was vandalized by teenagers, and now she roams the graveyard scaring folks, minus her head. Rookwood Cemetery, Sydney, Australia Close to one million people lie in the beautiful Victorian Rockwood Cemetery in Sydney, but it is the grave of the notorious Davenport Brothers, famous spiritualists, that is said to attract ghosts to the necropolis. Western Burial Ground, Maryland This graveyard in Baltimore has one thing going for it already. It's the final resting place of horror writer and poet Edgar Allan Poe. If that doesn't give you chills, maybe some of the stories will. This cemetery has an unfortunate history of live burials. Many spirits are said to haunt the ground, looking for revenge on those who buried them prematurely. There's even tales of a buried skull placed there to block out the sound of screams that seem to be coming from the severed head of a former minister. Many have claimed to hear the sound of screams, and some even claim it caused detrimental effects to their mental health. God's Acre Cemetery, Bethany, West Virginia The cemetery is said to be occupied by multiple spirits. Built in the 1820s, the cemetery later had a stone wall erected around it that has no breaks. The wall extends four feet up and goes another three feet underground. The rumor is that the wall was built that way to try and keep all of the restless spirits trapped in the cemetery walls. I'll have even more true stories of haunted cemeteries, graveyards, and mausoleums in the Sudden Death Overtime content in tonight's podcast being released immediately after the show. Thanks for listening. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter at Weird Darkness, and please tell others about the show who love the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. Doing that helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. You can also email me anytime on the contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marler. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, weirdos, keep listening. Hour two of the Weird Darkness radio show is coming up. Are you more than just a fan of Weird Darkness? Would you consider yourself a loyal listener of the podcast? Do you want even more content? Take your dedication to the next level by becoming a member of Weird Darkness's Darkness Syndicate. As a member of the Darkness Syndicate, you receive exclusive Weird Darkness merchandise, get daily episodes of the podcast commercial-free, along with commercial-free recordings of the weekly radio show. Listen to chapters of audiobooks I narrate even before the publishers or authors hear them. Get video updates about the Weird Darkness podcast and future projects that I'm working on before anyone else, and share your opinions on ideas to help me decide what to do in the Weird Darkness podcast in the future. You get all of these benefits starting at only $5 per month. Join the Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Sure, we've all received creepy phone calls from a random prankster, but what about those unexplained phone calls that led to tragedy? Those calls which foretold of death approaching, or even more chilling, a phone call from the ghost of someone who's already dead. Over the years, the wonderful invention of Alexander Graham Bell has not always been used to reach out to friends and family, but instead, at times, has become the instrument employed to terrorize, horrify, or mystify. Phone calls have been made by killers to contact their victims' families, taunting them. Others have taken prank calls to the next level, and people have come up missing or worse, dead. 
Sometimes there is no explanation whatsoever about a phone call that chills you to the bone. Tonight, I'll share some of the strangest, most bizarre phone calls ever received, and for some, the crimes to which they're attached. I'm calling this episode Calling 555 Terror. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to follow Weird Darkness on Facebook and Twitter and visit WeirdDarkness.com to find the daily Weird Darkness podcast, watch streaming B-horror movies and horror hosts 24-7 for free, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, send me your own true story of something paranormal that's happened to you or someone you know, and more. You can find it all at WeirdDarkness.com. Coming up this hour, we usually expect our horror stories to involve a haunted house or a fog-shrouded graveyard, but in modern times, some of the most terrifying stories have begun with a simple phone call. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. You don't need a haunted house, a cemetery, or even a dark road through the woods to experience terror. Sometimes terror comes to you via a phone call. At around 10 a.m. on November 22, 1963, a call was made to an operator in Oxnard, California. A woman began whispering to the operator. She stated that the president was going to die at approximately 10.10 a.m. The time came and went, and as far as the operator was concerned, the president was still alive. Then the mysterious caller changed the time of the president's supposed death to 10.30. The switchboard operator, believing to be a victim of a prank call, disconnected the line. President John F. Kennedy was in Dallas, Texas, riding in a motorcade on that fateful day. He was shot and killed at 12.30 p.m., which was 10.30 a.m. in California, where the call was made. The telephone company was never able to trace the calls, and the case of the anonymous telephone call about the president's death remains unsolved. The JFK files, declassified in 2017, also contained notes about an unidentified caller in the UK who predicted JFK's death less than a half an hour before it happened. This call also was never traced, and its origins remain a mystery. Bashir Kauchakshi was a restaurant manager at the Marrakesh, a Moroccan restaurant in Washington, D.C. Starting in 1983, a mysterious caller, or callers, began calling the restaurant on a daily basis, harassing the employers. The caller would threaten the employees with death and attempt to extort them, sometimes yelling obscenities. The caller would call the restaurant upwards of 15 to 20 times per day. Kauchakchi received the brunt of the abuse, and the majority of the threats seemed to be specifically for him. Even when Kauchakchi was not at the restaurant, the phone calls followed him. Kauchakchi would often travel to Pennsylvania to work at a sister restaurant of his, and the harassing phone calls would begin as soon as he stepped foot in the building. For Kauchakchi, the harassment was reminiscent of when he was kidnapped and tortured in 1974 by the Palestine Liberation Organization while staying in Lebanon. In fact, Kalchachi believes that the phone calls and his kidnapping are related, that someone was still trying to get to him from the kidnapping incident. Kalchachi became so paranoid and worried over the mysterious phone calls, he began losing sleep, 
not being able to eat, and his entire life suffered because of it. Eventually, he checked himself into a psychiatric hospital where he still goes when his life is too stressful. The FBI became involved in the case and were attempting to trace the calls, but were only able to trace the calls coming from random payphones from across the Washington area. The phone calls eventually stopped after nearly 10 years, and Kalchakji finally left the mental hospital. He never found out from where the calls came. 25-year-old Donna Lass worked as a nurse at the first aid station in a Tahoe casino. On September 6, 1970, she would disappear from the casino, never to be seen or heard from again. Various officers and detectives have worked on the case over the years, and many are under the assumption that Lass was a victim of the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer was responsible for a series of murders that took place in the 60s and 70s, taunting the police during his spree, and while there have been many suspects over the years, the killer has never been truly identified. What's interesting about the last case was that a man called both her boss and landlord, stating that due to a family emergency, Miss Lass would not be around for a while. Her boss at the casino was concerned by the call and called Lass's mother, who informed him she was not aware of any family emergency. If police are correct, and Lass was a victim of the Zodiac Killer, it's likely he was responsible for those phone calls. The Long Island serial killer is a suspect in a string of murders which have taken place near Long Island, New York. Police have yet to identify the person responsible for the killings, but have been able to link him to several due to his alleged modus operandi. The killer appears to choose sex workers as his victims primarily. He dumps their bodies on Gilgo Beach or Oak Beach. All the women seemed to be strangled to death, their bodies wrapped in burlap sacks. 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew is one of the victims linked to the Long Island serial killer. Bartholomew, a sex worker who used Craigslist to find customers, had made an appointment with a client on July 10, 2009. Bartholomew was never seen or heard from after the date. However, a week after Bartholomew's disappearance, her younger sister Amanda began receiving phone calls from Bartholomew's phone. The calls continued coming over the course of six weeks, and text messages as well. The police were only able to figure out the general area that the calls were being placed from, such as Madison Square Garden. The caller harassed Amanda, asking her vulgar questions and eventually telling her that her sister was dead and that they were responsible for her murder. Eventually, the calls ceased, and it's assumed that the person responsible for Bartholomew's death was the one who made the disturbing calls to her sister. Coming up, more creepy true phone calls on Weird Darkness. Do you listen to Weird Darkness while working on the job or at your place of employment? Do you have other co-workers listening in along with you at the office? If so, you'll want to register for the monthly Weird at Work contest. Make your way to the contests page at WeirdDarkness.com and fill out the entry form. On the first day of each month, I choose a random entry from all that came in over the previous month. If I draw out your entry, I'll send your place of business a Weird at Work prize pack, which includes four Weird Darkness coffee mugs, four Weird Darkness magnets, and a Weird Darkness t-shirt for you because you submitted the entry. Because people change jobs all the time, all entries are deleted after the first of each month. So, if you were not notified that you were a winner, just jump online and register again. If you're listening to Weird Darkness on the job along with other co-workers, the Weird at Work contest is for you. Just visit the contests page at WeirdDarkness.com to register for next month's giveaway. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Weird at Work. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. There are a ton of people who get creepy phone calls, and chances are, Theirs have been just as bad, if not worse, than yours, 
Here are a few more true, creepy phone calls. 49-year-old Charles Peck died in a tragic accident September 12, 2008. Peck was traveling from Salt Lake City, Utah to Los Angeles, California for a job interview. Peck's fiance lived in California and he was hoping to find a job so he could relocate to be near his wife-to-be. Unfortunately, once Peck arrived in the city, he was involved in a Metrolink train crash and killed along with 24 others. A total of 35 calls were made from Peck's cell phone after the accident to members of his family and his fiance. Anyone who answered the calls was met with complete silence. Later, it was discovered that Peck died on impact from the crash, so it's unclear how those 35 mysterious calls were made after his death. On October 27, 1989, 10-year-old Amy Miljevic was kidnapped from a Bay Village, Ohio shopping center. Tragically, her body was discovered four months later in a field with multiple stab wounds. Although the killer has never been caught, the case remains open with police diligently trying to find the perpetrator. An odd fact regarding the case concerns a phone call that Miljevic received from a stranger the week of her kidnapping. The caller spoke to the young girl about her mother getting a promotion at work. They wanted to take her shopping to get a gift for her mother, but insisted she not tell her mother about the shopping excursion as they wanted it to be a surprise. While Miljevic did not tell her mother about the call, she did tell her older brother Jason, as well as a friend from school. Then she and the mysterious caller set up the October 27th date for the shopping trip, and that would be the last location she had ever been seen alive. The police investigating the case soon learned that Miljevic was not the only young girl to get a phone call from the stranger. Several other girls in the area received the same kind of calls from a stranger, informing them that one of their parents received a promotion from work and that they wanted to assist them in getting a gift. Luckily, the other girls ignored the calls. 26-year-old Brandon Lawson disappeared after getting into an argument with his girlfriend on August 8, 2013. Lawson, a native of San Angelo, Texas, left his home shortly before midnight with intentions of going to his father's house. Lawson ended up running out of gas on the way to his dad's place and called his brother to tell him where he was and that he had run out of gas. Shortly after placing the phone call to his brother Kyle, Lawson made a 911 call saying that he needed help, that he was in a field, and to send police. Lawson also mentioned to the police that he ran into somebody. Lawson's reception was bad in the area and his phone cut out at certain points in the call, making it hard to understand the conversation. By the time police arrived at the scene of Lawson's abandoned truck, his brother Kyle, along with Kyle's girlfriend, also showed up. Lawson was nowhere to be found. Police did a thorough search of the area for Lawson, but have been unable to locate him. His phone, as well as his bank accounts, have not been accessed since his disappearance. 20-year-old Kelly Berg Dove worked third shift at a local gas station in Harrisonburg, Virginia. While at work on June 18, 1982, Dove began receiving obscene phone calls and became concerned enough to call the police about them. During the first call, Dove asked if an officer could come to the gas station to keep her safe. For whatever reason, Dove had to make multiple phone calls to the police before anyone actually arrived to check out the situation. During the third and final 911 call, a frightened Dove asked the police to come quickly, that the man was driving outside of the station in a silver Ford pickup truck. By the time police finally arrived, there was no sign of Dove, and she has never been seen again. The case remains unsolved today with no suspects. Sometime after 3 a.m. on April 6, 1986, there was a knock on the door of Penny Cayadetto's apartment. Cayadetto was asleep at the time and did not hear the knock, but Cayadetto's younger daughters recall their nine-year-old sister, Antoinette, going to answer the door. Antoinette never returned to bed in the Gallup, New Mexico apartment. Cayadetto noticed her daughter missing that morning and reported it to the police. Antoinette has never been found. A year after her disappearance, 
police got a call from someone claiming to be Antoinette Cayadetto. The girl explained that she was kidnapped and was brought to Albuquerque by her captors. Before the girl could say anything else, a man was heard in the background yelling, Who said you could use the phone? The phone was quickly disconnected, but not before the girl claiming to be Antoinette could be heard screaming. The police cannot be sure whether the caller was actually Antoinette or not and was unable to trace the call. The case remains unsolved. 21-year-old Rebecca Gabrielle Nuno was last seen leaving work in Cedar Hills, Texas, May 31, 2005. Later that same day, a co-worker received a call from Nuno saying that she was kidnapped. Weeks after she went missing, Nuno called her parents and told them to stop looking for her. Her parents thought the phone call was strange because Nuno refused to speak English to them. Nuno has not been seen or heard from since. 20-year-old Amber Takaro from Misiku Cree First Nation in Alberta, Canada, went missing on August 18, 2010. Takaro was staying in a hotel with her one-year-old son and a friend of hers, and they planned on visiting Edmonton the next day. Takaro decided she would leave her son with her friend and attempt to hitchhike to Edmonton, where her friend and son would meet up with her the following day. Takaro was picked up by an unidentified man while she was on the phone with her brother, who just so happened to be in jail. Takaro became paranoid when the driver who picked her up began going a different direction than where Takaro had anticipated traveling. Due to her brother being in jail, the 17-minute phone call was recorded by the prison, and Takaro can be heard saying to the driver, you better not take me where I don't want to go. The driver can also be heard on the phone call, insisting he's taking Takaro to where she had requested. The conversation with her brother turned out to be the last anyone heard from Takaro. Two years later, her remains were discovered by horseback riders. Investigators released portions of the recorded phone call, hoping that someone would recognize the driver's voice. To this day, the case remains unsolved. 42-year-old Dale Dwayne Williams lived in Nukla, Colorado, where he owned a body shop. Despite Williams owning the shop, he was not a mechanic. That's what makes his May 27, 1999 disappearance so strange. Williams received a call from a female stranded motorist on May 27, and he went to assist her. Williams' friend was there when he answered the phone and knew he was going to help the person with their vehicle. The next day, when Williams' wife realized he hadn't come home, she reported him missing. Williams never was seen or heard from again. Approximately two months later, his truck was located, submerged in a river, but Williams was not in or around the vehicle. It's unclear who the alleged stranded motorist was or whatever happened to Williams. Hey Weirdos, have you signed up for the Weird Darkness email newsletter? It'll keep you up to date on what's happening with the podcast, when our next Weirdo watch party will take place. You can see when the next sale in the Weird Darkness store is scheduled and more. Sign up for the Weird Darkness email newsletter for free at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like Weird Darkness and you want even more, you can check out the free audiobooks that I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there by Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Charles Dickens, Robert Heinlein, and more. You can listen to all of the free audiobooks I've narrated on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. There are tons of people who get creepy phone calls and chances are theirs have been just as bad if not worse than yours. Several Reddit users shared their tales of the creepiest phone calls they've ever had over the years. These may not have crimes attached to them as our previous stories, but nonetheless, these phone calls have kept people up at night for weeks or even years. Were they real people on the other end of the line? Ghosts? Versions of people from parallel dimensions? We'll never know but it sure is creepy to think about. A 
few years ago, my brother would get a call on his cell phone around 2 or 3 a.m. every night. He'd answer, and it was this hellish sounding noise, like static mixed with screams. He changed his cell phone number a month after this, and it stopped. But then after a week or so, it began again, the exact same noise, exact same time. Finally, one day he decided to backdial the call. It was an old man that had no clue what he was talking about. Still, the calls persisted. If he didn't answer, he'd call a few more times. No messages were ever left. He decided to say screw it, ended his contract with his phone company, switched to a new one, and even got a new number. You guessed it, the screaming static calls continued after a short delay. By this time, he was terrified every night. Unsure why this was happening, he backdialed the number again and got a different person. Around this time, he lost his job and his phone. The calls stopped, of course. This phone was disconnected now. So one day, my mom asks me to listen to this weird message she got on our home phone. It was the static screaming. We showed my brother, and he was freaking out. He backdialed the number again, and it said the number had been disconnected this time. Never heard from it again after that. When my sister was young, my parents got her a personal phone, a landline, so that she could feel special. Yeah, she was extra spoiled. It was a prepaid landline, though, so basically no one could call in or out if she ran out of credit, much like a mobile phone. Anyway, every night at 3 a.m., her phone would ring. She said there was a man on the other line and she'd get really scared and come running into my room. It escalated to the point that I asked her to please disconnect her phone before going to sleep because it became extremely annoying to get woken up every single night by this person that called her. Eventually, she just got rid of the phone. A few years ago, we were talking about it, and she confessed that her phone continued to ring even after she disconnected it, which is why she didn't want it anymore. She has no recollection of what the person on the other end was saying, or maybe she's just completely blocked it out. About a couple of weeks after I was born, my dad's best friend Jim died. They were really close, and one of the last things he wanted was to hold me before he passed away. Well, his wish was fulfilled, and a short time after that, he was gone. Fast forward seven years. I'm now a happy seven-year-old kid with a five-year-old brother and a recently born sister. But one day the phone rings, and with my mom out and dad in the washroom, I thought it was going to be ignored as we kids were still too young to answer the phone. No call display at that time. We didn't know if it would be a stranger. But my brother broke the rules, and he answered anyway. Hello? Well, at this point, my dad's out of the washroom, and he's asking my brother to hand him the phone. He ignores him and keeps listening to whoever is speaking. Before my dad could ask a second time, my brother hangs up, looks at him, and says, Jim says hi, and he misses Skywing Nova, and then goes back to playing. The look of shock my dad had is what I remember most about this. Before my family and I moved to another state, my father visited the area to check on the progress of our new house which was being built. My father was there for a few days and was staying at some crappy Motel 6 in a shady area of town. His room was the last room at the end of the hallway on the top floor. In the middle of the night, on the last night he was in town, he was woken by the phone ringing in his room. He groggily answers. It was the front desk, and they say something along the lines of, sorry to wake you, but we've been receiving a couple of reports about rooms being broken into and some stuff being stolen. We're calling to make sure that you lock your door and you're safe. Well, my father replies that he's fine, and he hangs up. He decides to double check that he locked the door. As he sits up in bed, he notices the door to his room is ajar. Well, being spooked, he cautiously checks out the room and finds nothing's missing, no one else is in the room, so he creeps to the door and peeks out. Sitting right outside his room on the windowsill of the hallway window is his shaving kit. Creeped out of his mind, he quickly grabs it and locks the door. After he calms down a bit, he calls down to the front desk and says, hey, you just called me about the break-ins around the hotel and I just want to report that my room was broken into when I was sleeping. 
Nothing stolen and I'm fine. Figured you'd like to know. The front desk replies, You must be mistaken. We never called your room and we haven't received any reports of break-ins. When I was a child, we would frequently get calls for a woman named Tanya. Didn't seem like a big deal. She had the same last name as us, although it's quite a common one around here. And when we moved across the city and phone books stopped being the go-to for finding somebody's number, the calls for Tanya gradually stopped. Those days seemed to have ended, and we carried on forgetting about the mysterious Tanya. It was about four years ago that she popped up in our lives again. I was driving home from work one afternoon and was greeted by a pretty grisly car wreck at the turn of my house. Two cars had collided, and one had wrapped itself around the signage pole that had house numbers and directions on it, one of which was my house number. Several days later, we get a call from the police. They asked if Tanya was at this residence. Her car was found wrapped around a pole down the street from my house, and she was nowhere to be found at the accident site. Haven't heard anything about her since. When I was younger, my family was extremely poor and lived in a very old mobile home on some land my grandpa owned. This piece of land was in a very small town out in the middle of nowhere Texas and covered in woods. The town itself was your typical small country town where football was king and there was nothing to do but get drunk or high on the weekend. It was also the type of town, along with it being the early 90s, where one didn't typically have to worry too much about locking their doors or setting an alarm. Now, our trailer was a two-bedroom, and my parents, always putting us kids ahead of themselves, slept in the living room on a fold-out couch. My room was directly connected to it, and my sister's room was down a hallway past the kitchen and bathroom at the other end of the trailer. One night, after everybody had gone to bed, my dad is woken up by a feeling that there's someone in the room. He looks around a bit and sees a large male figure sitting in the easy chair just feet from the bed. My dad quickly flipped on the light switch next to his bed and saw that it was a neighbor from down the road named Carter. Carter was known to be a frequent drug user and was often in trouble with the law because of that. My dad asked him what the hell he was doing here and told him to get out and he responded, I can't get out. The demons are chasing me and your house is the only safe one. My dad, who I should mention is fairly large and terrifying in person, responded that if he didn't get out and get out quickly that the house would be a lot less safe for him. If I leave, they'll get me, he said. They've been chasing me all night. If they catch me, I'm dead. My dad's response was that there were no demons, but that if he didn't get out of his house, he'd be dead. From what I've been told since I was asleep for that part, my mom also hurled a few threats and, while she may not be big, she is equally as terrifying. I believe it was her anger that finally scared the guy off. My dad got up and locked the door and watched through the blinds as Carter decided, since he couldn't outrun the demons, he'd steal our old beater Suburban that my dad always left the keys in. He drove around for about an hour. We called the police, and it took them about that long to get out to us, since the closest police station was about 20 or 30 minutes away. He finally brought it back and was arrested and taken to jail. He was deemed crazy and ended up locked in a mental institution. The scariest part is that for years after this, we would get phone calls where all we'd hear is music that would have lyrics like, I'm going to effing kill you. These calls lasted for years and followed us from house to house, even though we always had different numbers and would even be in different states. We always thought it was him sending us a message. The calls stopped when I was about 12. I later found out that it was around that time Carter thought the best thing he could do for himself was soak himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. My grandmother died of brain cancer about 20 years ago. About two weeks after she died, I was hanging out over at my parents' place and my mom got a call. No number, no unknown number, just blank caller ID. She answered it, got quiet, hung up and went to her room without saying anything. When I finally got her to talk about it, 
She said it was her mother saying that she was trapped and please come get her because they wouldn't let her leave over and over again. And then the phone disconnected. I asked her about it a few years ago and she denied that it happened for a bit and then finally admitted that yeah, it did happen two more times that year and then stopped. But she didn't want to discuss it anymore. We'll have more terrifying, true stories that all began with a simple phone call when Weird Darkness returns. If you're looking for Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find it in the Weird Darkness store. And no matter what you buy, 100% of the profits that I receive from the store are donated to organizations that help people who struggle with depression. You can search through all the merchandise by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. There are so many of these phone calls that are terrifying and true that I just don't have time to include all of them this hour in the show. So, I'm going to be sure to place them in the Sudden Death Overtime in tonight's podcast, which will be released immediately after the show is over. But in the meantime, let's hear a few more of these creepy true tales that all began with a phone call. It was my first time staying home alone while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I was 13, I think. I'm on the phone with a friend of mine, feeling so grown up when someone beeps in on the other line. I tell her I'll be right back and click over lines. And then the creepiest voice I've ever heard says, Hello, little girl. I'm the man in your basement. Now, honestly, I laughed it off and just hung up, thinking it was a prank call. I was a pretty confident little thing, and my neighborhood was pretty safe, so I figured somebody was just messing with me, knowing it was my first time alone. They beeped in again, so I clicked over and heard, Don't you effing hang up on me, you little bitch! And then the lights started flickering, and there was banging under my feet. I know it sounds crazy, but my dog started freaking out, and my cat ran away, so I assure you, I wasn't imagining a thing. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. It wasn't finished. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen, and I threw stuff in front of the door and heard yelling and whatnot. I kept trying to hang up and call the cops, but every time I tried, he was still on the phone. My friend told her parents what was happening, and they ran to a neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat 
petrified with a broken rifle, a butcher knife, and a baseball bat behind my front door because it's the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window, and I was crying. Eventually, I clicked over to hear a police dispatcher on the phone, and they stayed on the line with her until the police got to my house. There was no sign of forced entry, though we had a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior, and my guess is he used that to get in. The police assumed I was just a paranoid girl and they were going to leave me home alone after they gave an all-clear. Fortunately, a family friend had been driving by and saw the cops there and stopped to see if everything was okay. He gave me a ride to the school where my family was. They were skeptical that anything had happened, but we did get a security system not too long after that and my parents both got cell phones as well. This was 1994, I think, so cell phones weren't super popular yet. After that happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. I'd leave my apartment locked and bolted and come back to find appliances on, hair dryer, stove, heat on in the middle of the summer. I lived in four different places and I'd get strange phone calls at every one despite being unlisted. Cars would be randomly parked down the road from the house and would speed up and slam on the brakes as I would run inside. I'd hear loud bangs outside when I lived out in the country. Nothing has happened since I've been in my current house and married, but I am still super paranoid all the time. This one night, when I arrived for work, my supervisor looked confused and asked me what I was doing there. I said, I work tonight, and he said, but they said you called in a few hours ago saying you were sick. Well, I was a bit confused and said, yeah, it must have been someone else, and they got the message wrong. Well, after everybody else showed up for work that night, it was a bit more weird, but we carried on as usual and assigned everybody their places for the night. I went to work in the control room, where I usually work. The control room is the center of the prison that has direct control over the cameras, doors, phones, and everything. After I relieved the guard on duty and settled in for the night, I looked at the message that said I called in. It said I had called at 6.50 and said that I had gotten sick while out cleaning up after the storm. There had been a storm the night before, and it was a bit bad, but not anything that I had to go out to clean up. It was truly weird. The supervisor came into the control about that time. He was also a friend of mine outside of work, and we started talking about it and how odd it was. I decided to call my wife at home and tell her about it while I was just sitting there, and I picked up the phone and dialed. After two rings, a man picked up the phone and with a raspy voice said, Hello? I didn't know what to say for a few seconds. I looked at the phone to make sure I had dialed the right number, and I had. After a few seconds, the person said, Hello, again, in that same raspy voice. I said, Hello, who is this? This is Taylor. Who is this? The person said. My head started spinning because my name is Taylor. I said in an almost scream, where is Anne? And he said, Anne's in bed, who is this? I dropped the phone and told my supervisor to ring me out, I had to get home, and I took off towards the door. I could hear Dave pick up the phone behind me and say, hello, followed soon after by, what the F, rather loudly. I ran to my car and drove home faster than what was legal, my mind racing the entire time. I busted through the door and my wife was sitting watching TV and was shocked at me being home. I asked her who was there, and she said no one had been there. After a rather long talk with my wife, I went to call the prison to tell them what was going on, but the phone was dead. I went back to work, and when I came in, Dave was acting really weird and asked, how the hell are you doing this? He told me that when I left, he picked up the phone and the person on the other end sounded like me. He kind of freaked out and hung up the phone. A minute later, as he could see my car leaving the parking lot, I had called back from home and asked what was going on. He said that I was a bit irate and that I had said I was sick and didn't feel like playing these games and was telling him to stop prank calling me and then hung up. After convincing him I had no idea what was going on, we went back to work. Later, I find out that the phone line from my area had been knocked down the night before the storm. It's absolutely the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. Thanks for listening. 
If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast where you'll hear not only tonight's radio show, but also the extra sudden death overtime content that I prepared that I didn't have time to fit in. And while the radio show is one night per week, I upload episodes for the podcast seven nights per week. And if you're one of my patrons, you get a commercial-free copy of tonight's show immediately after it's over, including the overtime content. You can become a patron and or subscribe to the podcast at WeirdDarkness.com, or you can search for Weird Darkness wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter at Weird Darkness, and please tell others about the show who love the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. Doing that helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And if you'd like to be a part of the show, you can call in to the Dark Line toll-free and tell your own true paranormal story or a story that happened to someone you know. That number is 1-877-277-5944. Again, the toll-free number is 1-877-277-5944. You can also email me anytime on the contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Don't go anywhere, weirdos, because Sudden Death Overtime is up next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Savannah, Georgia is a town with a whole lot of character and a whole lot of ghosts. As the city expanded over the years, many old burial grounds were covered up, paved over and built upon, often without moving the graves that lay beneath. This has led Savannah to gain the nickname the city that lives upon her dead, and it's also led to plenty of ghostly tales and spectral sightings all over the city. Ask any local and many will tell you the most haunted place in all of Savannah is the Colonial Park Cemetery. The oldest extant burial ground in the city, the Colonial Park Cemetery lies right in the middle of the town's famed historic district, on the corners of Abercorn and Oglethorpe Streets. The six-acre cemetery was founded in 1750 and acted as the city's primary burial ground until 1853 more than 10,000 people are estimated to be buried in Colonial Park, though the cemetery is home to fewer than 1,000 grave markers. Roughly 700 of the cemetery's permanent residents lie in a mass grave, victims of the yellow fever epidemic of 1820. Some stories say that the dead actually number exactly 666, but the figure was rounded up to nearly 700 to avoid association with the number of the beast. Many of the dead are interred in the brick family burial vaults for which the cemetery is famous. These vaults, which were once underground structures that have been compared to root cellars, held the bodies of deceased family members on shelves. When time and the savanna climate reduced the corpses to little more than bones and dust, the remains were transferred into a large family urn, 
and the shelf reused for the next family member in line. During the Civil War, General Sherman's Union Army spared Savannah from complete destruction in his march to the sea, presenting the city to President Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift in 1864. However, members of the Union Army did desecrate and vandalize the tombs in Colonial Park Cemetery, often in strange and creative ways. These included moving headstones around and carving new dates on the tombstones with their bayonets. One man had his death date changed to indicate that he lived to the ripe old age of 544 years, while the vandals changed the dates on another stone to show that a man's son had been born 1,000 years before his father. Over the years, the boundaries of Colonial Park Cemetery have shifted, and there are some who claim that the dead are interred beneath the streets that border the cemetery. In the 1960s, workers doing construction on Abercorn Street supposedly found human bodies. Some point to the pattern of rises and depressions in the sidewalk that borders the street as evidence of wooden coffins beneath. Of course, any place with such a rich history of death and burial is bound to be home to more than a few ghost stories, and Colonial Park Cemetery is no exception. Some such stories concern the dueling grounds that were said to lie just beyond the south wall of the cemetery. Back when dueling was still legal, this was where gentlemen came to resolve their differences, often permanently. Today, the grounds are home to a basketball court and a children's playground, but some say that if you travel by at night, you'll see the ghosts of those who died in duels. One of the most famous ghost stories associated with the Colonial Park Cemetery concerns a man named René Rondolier. Rondolier's ghost has often been reported walking through the cemetery or hanging from the hanging tree which lies near the back wall of the grounds. Rondolier's ghost is said to be easy to spot because in life he was almost seven feet tall. The story goes that he murdered two young girls in the cemetery and was later lynched, either from the hanging tree or in the nearby square. Though there is little historical evidence to corroborate Rondelier's existence, in life, let alone in death, plenty of visitors to the cemetery report strange occurrences within the cemetery grounds. There are tales of shadowy figures and even a green mist moving among the remaining headstones. Colonial Park Cemetery is considered so haunted, in fact, that local paranormal investigators have taken to calling the graveyard Paranormal Central. Of course, upon your visit, you can schedule a ghost tour. New York City certainly has its fair share of hidden spots. From the abandoned buildings on dead-end streets, to colonial relics from the not-so-distant past. But along the northern coast of the Big Apple lies a small island with a dark and troubled history. Hart Island, located in the Long Island Sound just off the coast of the Bronx, is little known to city residents. Over the years, it has functioned as a Civil War prison camp, a sanatorium, and most infamously as an immense burial ground for the city's unknown dead. But just what is the story behind this mile-long sliver of land? Thomas Pell, a physician from England, came to the New World and purchased a substantial amount of land from the native inhabitants in what is now the Bronx and Westchester County. The year was 1654, and Hart Island was included in Pell's purchase from Chief Wampage of the Sewanee people. The exact amount Pell paid for the land is unknown though some rumors state it was nothing more than a cask of rum. During the Civil War, the island functioned as a prisoner of war camp for the Union Army. Just over 3,000 Confederate soldiers were jailed there, some dying during their stay. In 1869, the city of New York purchased the island for $75,000, transforming it into a potter's field for the city's growing burial demands. The first person to be interred on Hart Island was a 24-year-old woman named Louisa Van Slyke, who died in 1869 with no family or friends to claim her body. Initially, unknowns were buried in single plots, but as more and more bodies were shipped ashore, 
cemetery workers soon ran out of space. Consequently, the city started burying people in mass graves, long trenches that each held 48 bodies, one on top of the other. Children and infants were buried in troughs that held up to a thousand bodies. It wasn't long before the site became the largest tax-funded cemetery in the world. In addition to providing burial grounds for the outcast dead of the five boroughs, Hart Island also served as a quarantine site during a yellow fever outbreak in 1870 and was a convalescent hospital for tuberculosis patients. A labor center for delinquent boys was also established on its shores. In the late 19th century, Hart Island supplied overflow housing for female patients from the Blackwell Island Insane Asylum on what is now Roosevelt Island, receiving only the most chronic cases. Later, the outpost transformed into the Phoenix House, a drug rehabilitation center whose residents were tasked with fashioning leather shoes. Scraps of old leather still litter the island to this day. By 1977, following the closure of Phoenix House, the island was vandalized and nearly all of its burial records were lost in a fire. But that did not deter New York City from continuing to use the island as a burial site. Over one million people have been interred on Hart Island since it first started as a potter's field. All of the graves are unmarked, with the exception of one. That plot belongs to the first child to die of AIDS in New York, who was buried in isolation with no name. Today, the cemetery is a resting place for the indigent and for those whose families simply cannot afford to pay for a proper funeral. Inmates from nearby's Rikers Island perform the burials. The isolated nature of Hart Island has made it exceedingly difficult for the bereaved to pay their respects. Historically, grieving friends and family have been forbidden from setting foot on the island. It was not until July 2015 that the city government announced it would facilitate visits by family members, following the settlement of a class-action civil liberties lawsuit. Finally, some life will wash ashore on Hart Island. Sudden death over time. We hear darkness. St. Paul's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Alexandria, Virginia is home to a most peculiar grave, one that bears no name, only a haunting inscription, to the memory of a female stranger. The identity of the soul at rest beneath the headstone remains a mystery, attracting visitors and inspiring ghostly tales since at least 1833. The inscription in its entirety reads as follows. To the memory of a female stranger whose mortal sufferings terminated on the 14th day of October 1816, aged 23 years and 8 months, this stone is placed here by her disconsolate husband in whose arms she sighed out her latest breath and who under God did his utmost even to soothe the cold dead ear of death. How loved, how valued once avails the not to whom related or by whom beget, a heap of dust alone remains of thee. Tis all thou art, and all the proud shall be. To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whatsoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10th chapter, 43rd verse. The poetic verses are taken from Alexander Pope's 1717 poem, Elegy to the Memory of an Unfortunate Lady, with a few alterations. The first print mention of the grave of the female stranger appears to be in a poem published in the Alexandria Gazette in 1834, which details a visit to the tomb. The poem was published under the initials S.D. and later revealed to be the work of poet Susan Rigby Dallam Morgan of Baltimore, Maryland. Miss Morgan also wrote about the grave in her column for the Philadelphia Sunday Courier under the pen name Lucy Seymour. In an entry from 1836, Morgan wrote that the stranger had been a foreign woman of tearful face and a pale complexion, who traveled with a male companion said to be her husband, though locals doubted this claim. According to Morgan, the only soul that the stranger confided in before her passing was a local pastor, whose name is also lost to time. 
articles about the female stranger continued to surface throughout the years, growing more mysterious with each publication. In 1848, the Alexandria Gazette published a letter that claimed the grave belonged to a beautiful woman of pale complexion who was accompanied by a disreputable man. The companion gave his surname as Claremont and paid his bills with $1,500 in counterfeit English currency. An 1886 version, published in the Hyde Park Herald, added such dark Gothic details as a doctor sworn to secrecy and a reclusive husband who kept his wife's face hidden behind a veil and forbade anyone to speak to her or attend her funeral. An account published in the Washington Evening Star suggested that the female stranger and her male companion were doomed lovers. Yet another, penned by Colonel Fred Massey in the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette in 1887, adds that the lovers were European nobles who absconded to Alexandria and that the female stranger died in her husband's arms with their lips locked in a final kiss. The husband buried his partner in secrecy, then disappeared from town, only to return in the dead of night and exhume her body to take it with him. With little in the way of concrete proof, multiple theories as to the true identity of the female stranger have circulated. Some are comic in their outlandishness. One suggests that the female stranger was in fact Napoleon Bonaparte in drag, while others possess a whiff of truth. A persistent theory claims that the female stranger is actually Theodosia burr Alston, the daughter of Vice President Aaron Burr, who disappeared at sea some four years before the recorded death of the female stranger. Whoever she was, if she existed at all, the female stranger has left a lasting impression on Alexandria. Tourists visit her grave to this day. The stranger's spirit, too, still lingers. She is said to have died in room number eight at the nearby Gasby's Tavern. Some claim that her ghost haunts the room in which she passed and can be seen standing at the window and gazing out the glass. It's where you buy your groceries and where your kids go to play. But hidden, deep beneath the ground, are centuries of secrets. Across the world, construction workers and archaeologists are digging into the soil and they're finding pockets of bones, revealing a past that will no longer stay buried. Washington Square Park, New York what New Yorkers know today as a prime hotspot for green markets and people-watching was once a hotbed for disease-infested bodies. Originally a potter's field in 1797, the ground beneath Washington Square Park was used to bury those who died of yellow fever. In 1827, the space underwent a makeover with more than 20,000 putrefying bodies left to nourish the greenery above. 19th century lore has it that a blue mist emitted by the dead would hover over the park at night, and the park still holds secrets today. In November of 2015, city workers attempting to dig up an old water main instead unearthed a 19th century burial vault that led to yet another crypt. Mercedes-Benz Superdome, New Orleans in 1971, the construction workers broke ground in New Orleans to build the Superdome and soon found bodies and bones. Lots of them. Turns out they uncovered the remains of the Girard Street Cemetery, an old graveyard used to bury those who died of yellow fever and cholera. While the site was deconsecrated in 1957 and many of its eternal residents transported to new digs, not every body made the trip those souls not spoken for were left behind. The cemetery is technically located adjacent to the stadium under the parking lot. North Fulton Golf Course, Atlanta, Georgia Titleist enthusiasts teeing off on the fifth green at Atlanta's North Fulton Golf Course may have the hairs on the back of their necks tee off on their own, thanks to the 84 unmarked graves in nearby Chastain Park. It's believed course builders knew of the graveyard's existence when they started digging back in the 1930s, which was possibly an old burial ground for a former Ames house. Why they decided to build over it remains a mystery. 
Either way, play through. Wekako Playground, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania You'll never look at a set of swings the same way again after learning about the macabre truth lurking beneath the Wekako Playground in Philadelphia. In use from 1810 to 1864, the Bethel Burying Ground is where close to 5,000 African Americans were left to rest in peace. Abandoned, then used as a dump, the sacred ground today is home to a child's playland as well as a full-size tennis court. Shanghai Disney Resort in Shanghai, China Disney's first foray into mainland China, Shanghai Disney, may need to update its tagline from the happiest place on earth to the creepiest. According to Mental Floss, hundreds of burial plots were unearthed during the site's construction. The tombs had to be relocated with families of the deceased receiving 300 yen for the disturbance about $47. Lincoln Park, Chicago Now home to a jogger's favorite trail and a tourist's must-visit zoo, Lincoln Park in Chicago has a not-so-secret secret. There were thousands of bodies once buried below ground. Used as a graveyard for masses who died from cholera, some 80 bodies were unearthed in 1998 when construction commenced on Lincoln Park's parking garage. Though most of these bodies have since been moved, one tomb remains, the mausoleum of innkeeper Ira Couch. You can find it behind the Chicago History Museum. Crossrail's Liverpool Street Station in London During recent construction of the Crossrail's Liverpool Street Station, workers dug into a 300-year-old graveyard now believed to be the Bedlam Burial Ground a poor man's graveyard and the resting place of more than 20,000 skeletons. The macabre discovery was nothing compared to the violent tales told by the bodies themselves. Among the strange findings, archaeologists unearthed a row of skulls, a corpse with its skull strategically placed between its legs, and a skull with a gash in its crown where a hefty blade had pierced it. Liala District, Paris, France this bustling hub lures locals and tourists alike in Old Paris, but it's actually a bright facade covering up a très somber piece of history, the Cimetière des Innocents. Used from the Middle Ages to the late 18th century, this infamous burial ground contained massive pits that could house up to 1,500 bodies. The pits remained open until they reached capacity, which made for an odor stinkier than the city's beloved cheeses, not to mention a serious threat to public health. Beginning in 1786, the bodies were exhumed and moved to the catacombs, though some of the corpses had decomposed so thoroughly that there was little left to move. According to Scientific American, the bodies that had been reduced to globs of fat were actually transformed into candles and soap. The Medicellini Across Ireland Cellini, or the unconsecrated burial grounds where unbaptized children, along with illegitimate babies and their mothers, were left to mingle in limbo, can be found scattered across Northern Ireland. The Cellini burial goes as such. No mass, no ceremony, just a male family member laying the dead child to rest, the mother not allowed to hold her child, and other members of the family discouraged to participate. Today, archaeologists and humanitarians are working to ensure these lost souls are not forgotten. Sudden death over time, your darkness. Paris Catacombs, Paris, France. Listed by many among the world's most haunted places, the Paris catacombs buried deep beneath the streets of Paris hold the bones of over six million French dead, interred in the empty limestone quarries from 1785 through the 1800s. With so many bones stacked up everywhere you look, it seems impossible to believe that ghosts don't exist there. Boot Hill Cemetery, Arizona the Wild West is a place awash with ghost stories, from murdered cowboys to desecrated native populations, and Tombstone, Arizona has the honor of being among the most haunted of the bunch. 
several graves from the winning of the West marked the grounds, but the cemetery became famous when a photographer released a photo of what appeared to be a full-bodied ghost in the background, brandishing a knife. This has led many to flock to the area to see this phenomenon for themselves. Black Diamond Cemetery, Washington Visitors have described a lot of varying paranormal experiences, but the most common one is hearing whistling, often coming from multiple directions at once, even though no one is around you. Well, no one living, that is. El Campo Santo Cemetery, San Diego, California The now restored 1849 Roman Catholic burial ground known as El Campo Santo Cemetery is a popular place for ghost sightings. Some of the graves here were covered over by a street, and others have been desecrated over the years, reportedly leaving the residents restless. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, New Orleans, Louisiana When you think of famous cemeteries, New Orleans probably comes to mind. There are three St. Louis cemeteries in the Big Easy, but this one, No. 1, is said to be the most haunted. It's the oldest for sure, opening in 1789 to replace St. Peter Cemetery, which burned in 1788. It's no wonder the cemetery holds some haunts, with more than 100,000 people buried in a section of land about the size of a block, you'd expect that a few of them might have a little unfinished business. The tomb that tends to attract the most attention is that of Marie Laveau, the famous voodoo priestess, said to be spotted not far from her grave in the cemetery. People mark three X's on her tomb, believing that doing so will cause her to grant them a wish. There's also the grave of Henry Vines, a man who died suddenly and was placed in an unmarked grave as a result. He's said to be seen as well, and there are also stories of an unnamed young man walking the grounds in solemn despair. Greenwood Cemetery, Decatur, Illinois One of the most famous haunted cemeteries in the Midwest, Greenwood Cemetery is the site of numerous ghost stories and legends. The Civil War section is the most famous, said to be haunted by the ghosts of Confederate prisoners. Hollywood Forever in California This cemetery goes back to the 19th century and is the eternal host to several famous Hollywood stars. The Psalms Mausoleum is said to be haunted by cold drafts, eerie sounds, and the ghost of Clifton Webb. The grave of Virginia Rapp is also a hotbed for cold spots as many believe her spirit seeks justice for her unsolved murder. One such ghost story, recently thrust back into the spotlight thanks to Season 5 of American Horror Story, is that of Rudolf Valentino, whose grave is said to be visited often by a mysterious apparition in black that leaves fresh roses at his vault. Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery, Columbus, Ohio Fresh flowers often mysteriously appear on the grave of a Confederate soldier who is buried here, believed to have been left behind by the famous Lady in Grey. The ghostly widow who has been seen walking among the tombstones lost her husband at the Confederate prison camp which existed on this spot during the Civil War. Howard Street Cemetery, Salem, Massachusetts Few places in the world are more rife with talk of paranormal happenings than Salem. Giles Corey famously cried out for more weight when he was pressed to death after a conviction of practicing witchcraft. Perhaps less well-known are his cries that he cursed the land of Salem before his death. Since then, Salem residents, including the famous Nathaniel Hawthorne, claim to have experienced the apparition of Corey haunting the place where he died and the cemetery. Others have mentioned the strange aura the cemetery seems to take on at night, appearing incredibly quiet for its busy location in the town. Silver Cliff Cemetery, Colorado Ghost sightings in this haunted cemetery date back to the 1880s. Ghosts of pioneers are believed to be the cause of the blue balls of light that float over the graves. Union Cemetery, Connecticut This cemetery is so haunted that famous paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren once visited to conduct an investigation into the mysterious White Lady. Several origin stories exist for this prankster spirit, 
including the theory that she was murdered early in the 20th century or she was a wandering woman who died in childbirth. Either way, many have captured pictures of this specter and she has been known to play possum with unwitting drivers. Step Cemetery, Bloomington, Indiana A number of eerie legends and tales of paranormal activity have arisen from Step Cemetery, one of the most famous haunted cemeteries in the state of Indiana. The story is always a ghostly woman sitting watch over a gravesite, but the origins of the woman and her story seem to vary with each teller of the tale. Cemetery Hill, Gettysburg No town conjures up more images of ghosts than Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This unsuspecting town played host to some of the fiercest fighting of the American Civil War and paid the price for it in a number of ways. One is the lingering presence of spirits in the town. Cemetery Hill was the place of a gruesome summer battle that resulted in bodies piled high awaiting burial. People claim to experience a phantom smell of rotting flesh sometimes in the area. Some have even seen full apparitions that have touched them or communicated with them, often warning them to leave. Hey truckers, if you're on the road behind the wheel of a tractor trailer for a living, I have a contest just for you. Every month, I'm doing a random drawing from entries I receive in the Deadhead Truckers Contest. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash truckers and register to win. If I draw out your name, you'll win two Weird Darkness Trucker t-shirts, two travel mugs, a large pillow, and a blank hardback journal. If you listen to Weird Darkness because handling 18 wheels alone on the road by yourself just isn't scary enough, then this monthly contest is for you. Register to win at your next 10-100 and visit WeirdDarkness.com slash truckers. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash truckers. 